Praise the Lord. Sound check? We're good? Good afternoon, everyone. Come on, let's do it again. Good afternoon, everyone. Praise God. I'm so glad to be back. Ajunai. Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you so much for your prayers. So two weeks ago, we were in um, we were in London two weeks ago, London, Ontario. And so we conducted a seminar. And then last week, we were in, uh, no, the other week, we were in Windsor. And then um, another seminar yesterday in uh, Mississauga. So I really thank God for the um, strength. I really thank Him for the power of uh, healing. Yes. And again, we just praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? So I'm so glad to study God's Word with you again this afternoon. Today is what is called traditionally... Palm Sunday, it's also called Triumphal Entry. You know, this event marks the beginning of the final week in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, what transpired on this final week is the very, the very first Holy Week. And it constitutes the very foundation, the very heart of biblical Christianity. So during this final week, we have the Last Supper. We have the arrest and the trial. We have the Roman scourging. We have the crucifixion and burial. And finally, the most important event of all, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, it's no exaggeration to say that without this final week, there would be no Christianity. Everything we are, everything we have, and everything we ever hope to be is founded on what transpired on this final week. And it all started with the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this event is so important that all four Gospels recorded this momentous event. In the Gospel of Matthew, we find it in chapter 21, in Mark 11, in Luke 19, and in John chapter 12. Now, we need to look into all four accounts to get the overall picture but time will allow me to study only a few of the most important details of this momentous event. Now, if we are to play the role of a reporter from the Toronto Star, and we are to tell people what happened on this glorious day, we need to find out the five W's and an H. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. And of course, the most important detail in our reporting is why this all took place. What's the purpose for this whole event? I've entitled this message, Palm Sunday, when the king came to clean up. When the king came to clean up. So let's bow our heads, shall we, and just uh, commit this uh, study to the Lord. Most gracious God, we thank you for the confidence that we have to approach your throne of grace because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that because we have received him into our lives, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And so your spirit will speak to us right now. Your spirit will convict us right now. Your Holy Spirit will cleanse us this afternoon. And so Father God, thank you again for the privilege to have a special touch from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. amen and amen. Okay, so let's start with the question of where. Where did this take place? The place, John chapter 12 verse 1 says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Okay, that's the place where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then in Matthew chapter 21 verse 1, it says, They approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage. Before I thought it's Bethpage, but <laughs> when I was in Israel, the way they pronounce it, it's Bethpage, all right? On the Mount of Olives. And so this Mount of Olives runs north to south. And if you go through the, the eastern slope, about one and a half kilometers down is Bethpage. And then farther down, the eastern slope of Mount of Olives is the, is the, uh, there, the uh, city of, uh, or the place called Bethany, the town of Bethany. That's about three kilometers from Jerusalem. And then on the western slope 
is the Kidron Valley. Right there, that's the Kidron Valley. And then across the Kidron Valley is the temple, the Temple Mount right there. And then, of course, Mount of Olives is at the top right here. And so it's going down to the eastern slope and then going down to the western slope to the Kidron Valley. Now, if you use a Google map, that's the Google map right there. And that spot right there is where all tourists would gather and they will take a picture of Je with Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem as a background, and you will see immediately this uh, Dome of the Rock. And so that's where all uh, tourists would go. And so that's the picture of uh, when we went to Israel together with my uh, son and my daughter. And Jed is also there. Do you see Jed right there? She is tall. That's Jed right there. All right. And so according to John chapter 12, Jesus was in Bethany spending time with Lazarus. Remember, in John chapter 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead. And so he was in Bethany spending time with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. All right, so we've answered the question of where, the place. Now the question of when. When did this happen? It happened on the Passover. The Gospel of John gives us this information as to when this happened. John chapter 12 verse 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And then 11 verses after this, here's what John wrote. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Now the time aspect here is very important. Why? Because this would give us a, a feel of what was happening in Jerusalem during this time. Now there are seven festivals that they celebrate. There are four in the spring feast and there are three in the fall feasts. So first of all, they have Passover sometime March and April. And then that night they would have the unleavened bread. And then three days later the, they have the first fruits. And then 50 days after Passover you have the Pentecost. And then the fall feast, the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. That's their new year. Then you have the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, of all these seven, there are three festivals that call for compulsory, compulsory, that should be the way to pronounce that, compulsory attendance. It's Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And so the law was that every adult Jewish male, 12 years old and above, who lived within 32 kilometers radius of Jerusalem, they must come to this, these festivals. And so the Jews, especially outside the city, outside the country, they always long to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And so you can just imagine Jerusalem is bulging with pilgrims. In fact, according to one census, the number of lambs slain in Jerusalem for the Passover this was recorded by Josephus, the Jewish historian. The number of lambs killed during the Passover was 256,000 lambs. Wow! Can you imagine 256,000 lambs? That's a lot of lamb chops. I love lamb chops. 256,000 lambs in one Passover. And do you know that one lamb can represent a whole family? And so that means there must have been about a million people there in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem, to celebrate the Passover feast. Now on an ordinary day within the walled city of Jerusalem, the population at the time of Jesus may be about 50,000 people. But during the Passover feast, one million in and around Jerusalem. Wow! This is quite a celebration, friends. The Lord could not have chosen a more dramatic moment. He came for his last evangelistic crusade. And he chose this hour to offer himself as king to Israel. Now many times you read in the Gospels, Jesus Christ would tell people, no, 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 don't announce it, don't announce it. It's not yet my time, it's not yet my time. I don't want to be king yet. Many times you'll read that. But he chose the time, this time when Jerusalem was surging with people who are spiritually high, with expectations. And friends, we are indebted to Sir Robert Anderson for establishing the date of the triumphal entry in his monumental book, The Coming Prince. 
written in 1894, he calculated the date by taking into account Roman documents and the, the time references that Dr. Luke in his gospel uh, tells us. For example, Luke chapter 3 verse 1, it says here now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. And so this is the running 15th year. And then verse 2 says, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Annas is the retired high priest, his son-in-law. Caiaphas was the reigning high priest, but Annas was in control. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And then verse 21 now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. Verse 23, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. So, friends, if we look at the chronology of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, this means his ministry started in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, we know from Roman records that Augustus Caesar, the Caesar before Tiberius Caesar, died on August 19, 14 AD. And Tiberius Caesar replaced him that same year. And Dr. Luke wrote that it was during the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar that Jesus Christ started his ministry. And so, if Augustus Caesar died in 14 AD and then immediately was replaced by Tiberius Caesar, and so it started in 14 AD, he was already reigning for 14 years, and so 14 AD plus 14 years equals 28 AD. 28 AD is the running 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. That means, friends, Jesus' ministry started in the fall of 28 AD. Now, the triumphal entry occurred on the fourth and the last Passover attended by the Lord Jesus Christ. And Sir Robert Anderson calculated by comparing the Jewish calendar, which is 360 days per year, and then the Gregorian calendar, which is 365 days per year, and then he calculated when Jesus presented himself as the Messiah Nagid, the Messiah, the King. And he found out that it happened on April 6, 32 AD. Which, by the way, was on the 10th of Nisan. April 6, 32 AD happens to be the 10th of Nisan. Now, why is that detail important? Well, it's important because of this. You see, the high priest on the Passover week, they will get the lamb to be sacrificed on the 10th of Nisan. They will select this lamb. You know, it's very strict, the Levitical laws. Uh, there should be no bone that is problem, uh, problematic. There, it should be without blemish. You know, it should be healthy. And after four days of inspecting this lamb, and if it passes, the high priest will declare, Behold the lamb, I find no fault in him. And then on the 14th of Nisan, which is the Passover day, 3 o'clock that afternoon, this lamb, the throat will be slashed, the, the blood will be spilled, and then it will be burned as a sacrifice. Well, in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he presented himself to be the king on April 6, 32 AD. This was the 10th of Nisan. The people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And after this presentation, you'll find in the Gospels that the high priest, the chief priest and the Sanhedrin, they were looking for a way to accuse Jesus so that they can kill him. They were looking for something that would make him accountable and then be murdered for it. They were finding fault in Jesus. And you know what happened after four days of finding fault with him? Mark 14, 55 concludes the, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any. The Lamb of God, behold, I find no fault in him. And the Lord Jesus Christ, after four days, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. On the 14th of Nisan, he gave up his spirit, 3 o'clock that afternoon, the same time that the lambs are being killed. And offered as a sacrifice. Friends, that is no coincidence. The question is where, the place, when, the Passover. Now let's look at the preparation. In Matthew chapter 21, the three first three verses, it says here, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. 
Verse 2, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. So that's the mother, donkey, and then the young colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And then verse 3, If anyone says anything to you, say, to that, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And so again, remember they were here in Bethany, and then he sent the two disciples ahead to Bethphage to untie these donkeys. And so there in 21 verses 6 and 7, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And then it says, verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Friends, what we see here, Jesus Christ as king just commanded the colt. He just commanded the court. He claimed his mouth decisively. No one prevented him from doing so. Nobody questioned him. Why did you untie this? The mother, need, the, 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 the Lord needs it. And they just, gave, they, they, they just surrendered the court. But friends, to command a court is one thing, but then to control the court is completely another thing. It's a miracle. In verse 7, it says they brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And so Jesus Christ did not only command this colt, he controlled this colt. Now what happened here, as we read Mark chapter 11, what happens is that the Lord Jesus Christ sat on the colt, the young donkey, with the mother on the side, walking along. All right? I did some research and found out that it takes eight weeks to break in a colt. Just to break in is already eight weeks. Now, to train this young animal to behave in a crowd where people are waving these palm branches, the children are shouting, the men and women are singing, with all the confusion and the hysteria that must have occurred on the streets of Jerusalem. Now, friends, that could take months, even years, for that colt to behave. The first time somebody sat, on that coat. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ controlled this coat completely, showing indeed that he is the king. He is the master of all creation. He is the king of kings. The question of where, the question of when, the question of how, and now the question of who? The people. Now, as we have already noted, Jerusalem was bulging with pilgrims during the Feast of Passover. And there could be about a million in and around Jerusalem during this time. And while Jesus was still in Bethany, spending time with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, it says there in John chapter 12, verse 9, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there. Where, where's the there? In Bethany. And came. That means there's a big crowd from Jerusalem who were gathered for the feast. They found that the Jesus is in Bethany. Three kilometers away from Jerusalem, they went all the way to Bethany. It says there, to see Lazarus, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, that's an Israeli Uzi. Mga Uzi Zero. All right? And so they went to see with their own eyes. And so now we have a great crowd that went down to Bethany. And so we have this great crowd from here going down to Bethany to see Lazarus with their own eyes. Now, of course, Jesus already did this kind of miracle, raising people from the dead, but never like this one. You know, the others that he had brought back to life, they just died. They just recently died. Maybe some people will still uh, debate, you know, maybe he wasn't really dead. Maybe the Tabitha wasn't really dead. You know, maybe they just missed the pulse, or maybe nakalimutan lang huminga nun sandali. You know, she just forgot to breathe for a few moments. It could be debated. But friends, in the case of Lazarus, he was already buried for four days. Now, there is a Jewish tradition, and this is only a tradition, that the spirit remain in the body only for three days. And then the spirit will depart. And so friends, what is happening here is that it's impossible for Jesus to restore Lazarus back to life because it's already been four days. But the more pressing reality is that decay is now setting in. Brothers and sisters, miracle of miracles, Lazarus came back to life. And so you can just imagine the news. You know, the news that had gone out from Bethany and then spread throughout Jerusalem. 
which was bulging with pilgrims, that Jesus who had just raised Lazarus from the dead, he is on his way to Jerusalem. And you can just imagine the excitement. John chapter 12, verse 12, on the next day, the large crowd in Jerusalem who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and then verse 13 says, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So friends, now what we have here are two great crowds of people, one together with Jesus who are traveling from Bethany to Bethphage and then now up there on Mount of Olives about to go down and then go to Jerusalem and the other crowd waiting there in the streets of Jerusalem. And so there was so much excitement. Many people are now beginning to wonder, could this be really him? Is this really the Messiah? Is this the son of David who will reign forever as king? Is this the time that we will be liberated from the clutches of the Roman Empire? The people are now responding magnificently. They secured palm branches, the symbol of victory, which they waved jubilantly in the air. They also laid their coats on the road to give the king a red carpet treatment. Children were singing, the adults were shouting appropriate slogans. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. Now what does the word Hosanna mean? The Hebrew term is actually Yashia'ana, transliterated as Hosanna, which means save us now. Save us now. That's what they were shouting. It's the people's cry for deliverance, for help in the day of trouble. It was the cry of oppressed people who are crying for liberation. Hosanna, save us now, son of David. And you can just imagine these two great crowds of people coming down with Jesus and the other waiting for him out there on that fork in the road. There's that fork in the road there. As they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David, save us now. And jubilantly waving palm branches. Now it seemed only a matter of time that Jesus will now take over and reign as king. Now, what do you think the people were expecting when Jesus reached that fork in the road? When he reached this fork in the road, they were expecting him to turn right or to turn left. If he turns right, he goes straight to Fortress Antonia, and Fortress Antonia is the garrison of the Roman soldiers. That's their station. But then if he turns left, he goes straight to the beautiful gate and go inside the temple area. Friends, with all the people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, they were expecting him to turn right or to turn left? They were expecting him to turn right and then go to Fortress Antonia and then kick the Roman soldiers out of their garrison and liberate the nation from the clutches of the Roman Empire. But to their amazement, to their frustration, Instead of turning right, he turned left, went straight to the temple area, and kicked the Jewish businessmen out of the temple area. And that's what we read here in Matthew 21, verse 12. It says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Can you imagine the shock? Can you imagine the disappointment these people must have had? This couldn't be the Messiah. This is impossible. And that's why, friends, within four days, they changed what they were chanting. On the 10th of Nisan, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Four days later, on the 14th of Nisan, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Their applause turned to hatred, their adulation was replaced with a murderous intent. Crucify him. Crucify him. This is the same crowd. But now they have a different heart. Disappointed with Jesus. And if I ask you this afternoon, have you been disappointed with Jesus? Was there a time in your life when you asked him to do something and he didn't do it? Was there a time in your life when you prayed so hard and you 
wet your pillows with tears. And yet, Jesus did not answer. In fact, he did the opposite. Was there a time when you were prostrated with Jesus? When we shout to the Lord, Hosanna, save us now, what are we really saying? Save us from what? Brothers and sisters, I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you this afternoon that Jesus did not come here primarily to save us from our loneliness. Jesus Christ did not come here first of all to save us from our prostration or our boredom or our discomfort or our poverty or our sickness or our discontent. No! That's not the reason why He came here primarily. And the tragedy is that's all we want from Him. But Jesus Christ came here primarily, first and foremost, to save you and me from our sins. And there are people today, they come to Jesus only because they have some needs, a discomfort, some disease, some weakness, some boredom. But they don't want Jesus to save them from their sins. When they get here, they just go back to the same things that they were doing before. They would be crying for help, and when they got the promotion, they're still cheating. They're still lying. Nothing has changed. Jesus Christ did not come here primarily to save us from all these things, but to save us from our sins. But there are people today, they come to church to be comforted with their problems, but they don't want to, confronted, to be confronted with their sins. But friends, Jesus came here to deal with one thing and one thing only. All these other things, including healing, are just the byproduct once he saves us from our sins. The question of, the, of where, the question of when, the question of how, who and now the why. Matthew 21 verse 4 tells us the why. This took place to fulfill. Okay, so this is the why. To fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And this is the prophet Zechariah. And then verse 5 says, Say to the daughter of Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now without question, the point of this whole episode is to present Jesus as the king. Zechariah had prophesied about it, and now Jesus is bringing, bringing it to life before their very eyes. But now when you read the Gospels, you will notice that a couple of times, the crowd became enthusiastic and they were ready to crown him to be their king. But you know what Jesus Christ would do? He would just slip away. It happened in Nazareth. And in the Gospel of John chapter 6, remember after the feeding of the 5,000? Here is what it says. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And you know what they did? Verse uh, 15 says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. In fact, the very brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 7, they were urging Jesus, Come on, present yourself there to the temple so that you will be declared as king. And Jesus Christ said, my time has not yet come. He never allowed himself to be presented as king. But now here, in Matthew chapter 21, he did something very strange. He is not only permitting it, he is in fact arranging it. He actually made arrangements to fetch the donkey and ride on it and deliberately set it up to fulfill Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. Friends, this is not a coincidence. This is very deliberate. But now, to understand what's happening here, why did he choose this specific day to present himself as king? Friends, to understand that, we need to go back to the book of Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. These probably are the four verses in the, mo in the whole Bible as the most important prophecy in the whole Bible. This is the key to all end time prophecy and this is called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. Now I don't have the time to discuss it in detail but here's the context. 
Remember, Daniel was taken into Babylon as a teenager, maybe 13 years old, when he was taken there. And now, he is already in his late 80s. And Daniel was praying one time, you know, the prayers of the Jews, they pray 9 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So 9 o'clock in the morning, Daniel, as his, as his practice, he prayed, opened the windows towards Jerusalem, towards the temple. And then he was reading, reading from the book of Jeremiah. And then he read there in Jeremiah chapter 25 that their stay, that their exile in Babylon will last only for 70 years. Only 70 years. And Daniel got so excited. Lord, this is it. It's almost 70 years now. Father God, what is going to happen? And he started confessing his own sins, confessing the sins of his family, con confessing the sins of his, of his uh, fellow men. And he was asking God, 9 o'clock in the morning, 12 noon, and then 3 o'clock that afternoon, he was interrupted. The angel Gabriel appeared in his prayer room, and angel Gabriel gave him an answer. Here is the answer to your question, what will happen after 70 years? Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, the prophecy says, Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until, friends, that one there, until, very important conjunction, the anointed one, the Messiah Nagib, the Messiah the King, comes. And so what he's saying here is from this event to that event, how long will, be, will it be? There's a specific period of time. And how long? Well, it continues by saying the time frame is 70 sevens and 62 sevens. Now, sevens of what? This is not sevens of days. This is not sevens of weeks. This is not sevens of months. This is sevens of years. Seven sevens and then 62 sevens. That's 69 sevens all in all. And so 69 sevens is the time gap between the commandment to restore Jerusalem and then the Messiah will appear. So 69 sevens, their one year is 360 years. And so the angel Gabriel tell, told the uh, prophet Daniel, you just have to wait 173,880 uh, days and then the Messiah will appear. Now what is going to trigger this is the commandment, it says there, from the time the word goes out to goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And what's going to happen in Jerusalem? Again, we're indebted to Sir Robert Anderson, who in this book in 1894, he told us the different decrees to rebuild Jerusalem. And so there was the first decree by Cyrus in Ezra 1. There was another decree by Darius in Ezra 6. A decree by Artaxerxes in Ezra 7. And then a second decree by Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2. But friends, it's very specific what kind of decree is this. It says there, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and what's going to happen? It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench. The Hebrew word for trench is a wall. There will be a wall around Jerusalem that will be rebuilt. Now, friends, now we know that the decree of Darius is not the one, it's not the decree that they were waiting for. That's a decree about the rebuilding of the temple. It's not the decree of Darius. It's not the first decree of Artaxerxes. But the second decree of Artaxerxes, when Nehemiah was commissioned to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Friends, that is the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. And the calculation here is that it happened on March 14, 445 B.C. March 14, 445 B.C. Is the, is the decree. Now, if we compare that now, here we have March 14, and then we, here we have April 632 A.D. Now, this is now Greg, uh, the Gregorian calendar. If we deduct 445 B.C. and 32 A.D., that will give you 173,740 days. You deduct March 14 and April 6, that will give you 24 days. Now, in the Gregorian calendar, there's a leap year every four years, so you need to add 116 days. Friends, if you add 173,740 days plus 24 plus 116, equals 173,880 days, exactly as the angel Gabriel said. And this is the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ had to wait. It's not at my time. It's not at my time. Jesus Christ had to wait when the 69th week is completed. 
to fulfill this prophecy. That means, friends, the crucifixion was not a tragedy. The crucifixion was an achievement. He came here for that achievement. To be nailed on that cross. But you know what is the saddest thing about the triumphal entry? You know, Jesus is here to present himself as king to Jerusalem. It should be one of the most exciting days in their history. But you know what happened? They did not recognize it. Luke 19, 41. Now, this is present day old Jerusalem, the old city right there. And you're standing here on Mount of Olives. Now, if the scholars are correct that the position of the uh, Dome of the Rock is where the temple was. So, let's put the temple there. And Jesus was right here on top of Mount of Olives and he's riding the donkey going down the slopes, the western side of that slope. And as he was coming down and he saw the city, here's what happened. It says there, as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and what happened? He wept over it. Now friends, the English doesn't show us what really happened here. You see, there are two Greek words for weep. There's a Greek word for weep, to weep silently. And the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11.35, Jesus wept, is to weep silently. A tear just dropped from, on his cheek. But then the weep here, in Luke chapter 9, verse 41, he wept, is to weep loudly. Jesus Christ was wailing. This was an uncontainable, audible grief. His wailing could have been heard throughout the Kidron Valley. And why? Because Jesus Christ said, if you, even you, what he's saying is that of all the people in the world, it's you, the Jews. You should know this day. You have the prophets. You have the prophecies. You could have studied this. You should know when the Messiah will be presented. And because of that, he said, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And what is that day? 173,880 days. You should have known this. It's in your Bibles. You're not reading your Bibles. You just wait for Sunday to come and then study the Word. But Monday to Saturday, you don't read the Bible. And the Lord Jesus Christ said as a punishment, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Now their eyes were blinded. Their hearts were hardened. And what's the reason? Jesus Christ said, because you did not recognize the time, of God's coming to you. Brothers and sisters, that means Jesus is holding them accountable to know this scriptural fact. They ought to know the Bible. Now that's a sovereign thing to think, isn't it? Our prayer is that we won't make the same mistake. Brothers and sisters, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance can cause death. My people perish because of lack of knowledge, lack of wisdom, lack of vision. If you claim to be a Christian, are you really studying your Bible? Are you really taking the time to read God's word and inform yourself of the things that are happening around us? Or do you just wait for Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon to hear about the word of God? We ought to know what God says in his word because God will hold us accountable. The question of where, the question of when, how, who, why, and finally, the question of what. What is the purpose for all of this? Matthew 21, 12 to 13, it says here, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling Doves, and then verse 13, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Friends, here in the temple grounds, there are two businesses that were going on. There were two kinds of trading that were going on. First of all, there was the business of changing money. You know, every Jew, they have to pay a temple tax, and that's about one half shekel. But then they have to pay it in a certain currency. They cannot use the Roman currency because the human currency has the image of Caesar. And the Jews are allergic to images. 
And so they have to change this currency into the temple currency, and that's why you have money changers. But here the problem is this. There was a markup of almost 30%. That means if you have $100 and you're going to change it, what will return to you is only $70. The $30 goes to the money changer. And who owns that business? Anas, the high priest. The second kind of trading that was going on in the temple grounds is the selling of animals for sacrifice. Now, the Levitical laws is very strict about the qualification of these animals. And so people, they can buy animals outside the temple grounds. But there are inspectors at the gate, and most likely the animal you bought outside will not pass. And so people are forced to buy inside, and the price of the animals inside is about times five. And who owns that business? Anas, the high priest and his family. And so what makes this thing really stinks is that the high priest and his family runs the business. And that's why the temple ground was known as the bazaars of Anas. He is retired supposedly. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the high priest at the time. But Anas was the real power behind the throne. The bazaars of Anas. But Jesus gave it a more accurate term and he called it a den of robbers. A den of robbers. After Jesus presented himself as king, friends, the first order of business is the cleansing of the temple. And yet today, if you go to Jerusalem, there's no more temple there. But God's word declares that anyone who receives the Lord Jesus Christ, when you pray for the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, and you surrender your heart to Him, invite Him to come into your life, you know who comes in? The Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is, is seated right now at the right hand of God, but the Holy Spirit indwells your body. And the Bible says your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16, let's all read this together. Ready, read. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you. Did you know that? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I know for some people it's more like a basilica, but, but it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But then, three chapters later, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20, let's all read this together. Ready, read. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And this afternoon, friends, we can honor God with our bodies as we submit to our king. The first order of business is to cleanse our temples, to cleanse our bodies, to cleanse our minds, to cleanse our hearts, to cleanse our hands, to cleanse our eyes, to cleanse our ears, to cleanse our mouths. And that's why I've entitled this sermon this afternoon, When the King Came to Clean Up. I have no doubt, if you're honest enough, that we all need cleaning up. Amen? We all need cleaning up. You know, this Holy Week, people will be holy for a week. And then they go back to their old sinful ways after the Holy Week. Palm Sunday is the time when Christ offered himself as king. But as we have studied here, the people expecting him to liberate them from their problems, but not really to save them from their sins. To liberate them politically, but Jesus Christ came here first and foremost to cleanse us spiritually. And today, we can experience the power, the cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And praise God, Jesus is here, the Holy Spirit is here, and we can experience the cleansing power of that blood. I'd like to call on the worship team to join me here. But friends, there are at least three ways you can be blessed this afternoon. I don't want you to leave those doors without being blessed. Three ways to be blessed this afternoon. Number one is for those of you who have not surrendered your life yet to the Lord Jesus Christ. You actually do not know if you're going to heaven or not. You don't have an assurance. 
In fact, there's fear in your heart. If something happens to you, you're actually lost. Well, friends, this afternoon, you can experience the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'll be leading you in a prayer where you will surrender your life to Him. And then the Holy Spirit will indwell you. That's the first one. The first way you can be blessed this afternoon. The second way you can be blessed this afternoon is if you already prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is already there within you, and yet you know that you are still living in sin. You know that you are violating your conscience. You know that the Spirit is convicting you about that thing in your life, and you're just letting it go. This afternoon, you can be released from these bandages. Maybe it's visiting pornographic websites. Maybe it's your tongue. You keep saying the F word. Maybe it's your attitude. Maybe it's a relationship with your parents. Any problem that you might have, you can be released this afternoon. But the third way you can be blessed this afternoon, and this is where we really want to bless people this afternoon, because Jesus Christ wants to cleanse your body. If you're here this afternoon and you're feeling sick, somehow there are diseases in your body, somehow there are infirmities in your body, Jesus Christ already died for those infirmities. You can be cleansed in that body and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is already within you. That's the Holy Spirit. And so we want people to, we, I want to pray for people right here. You know, I was diagnosed in January that I have, uh, I have prostate cancer. It's level stage four, the doctor said. The doctor said, Roy, this is already incurable. You will die with this disease. The only thing we can do with you is go some procedures to extend your life. You know, in my heart of hearts, I said, praise the Lord. Doctors do not have the last word. God has the last word. Now, I respect doctors, but you see, doctors are limited by science. They don't know the supernatural. They don't know the power of the cross. They don't know the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this afternoon, if you're feeling something, if you're sick, we want to pray for you. And we want your body to be cleansed. This is the cleansing time. The king came to clean up. Come on, let's all stand and let's sing with the worship team and then we will have three prayers here this afternoon. Three ways to be blessed this afternoon. Tomb of sin, you 
were buried for three days, but then you walk right out again, and now death has no sting, and life has no end, for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Oh, we praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, oh Lord Jesus, for the salvation that is already ours. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Again, I do not know most of you. I don't know where you really are spiritually. But again, as I've said, if you are not sure that you're sure and that you're sure that you're going to be in heaven, that you have a living, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is the time that you can pray and ask Jesus Christ to come in. And so right now, just raise your voice. Just say with me these words. Just shout it out. This is between you and God. Only God knows your heart. I do not know, but repeat with me these words and really mean it in your heart. Heavenly Father, say it. Heavenly Father. I thank you for your love, for your great love for me, that you surrendered your own son to die for my sins. Lord, I ask for forgiveness. I believe that Jesus alone can save me from all my sins. I believe he died on that cross. And I believe that he rose again three days later. I confess it in my lips. And I believe it in my heart. I now open the door of my heart. And receive Jesus Christ to come into my life. Oh Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. Be my king. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now let me pray for those who prayed that prayer. Maybe this is the first time you actually prayed that prayer. I'm going to ask now our Heavenly Father because He promised that, your, that the Holy Spirit is here and He will indwell you. Father God, Lord, those who pray this prayer, I pray right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will just bear witness with their spirits. Indwell them, Heavenly Father. Empower them, Heavenly Father. Lord, fill them with that assurance. Fill them, Lord, with the peace that the world cannot give. And Father God, Lord, I pray that your spirit will be vibrant in their spirits, that they will actually hear his voice, that they will actually be guided by your spirit. And Lord, right now, we realize, Lord, that those of us who have been Christians for some time, Lord, we failed you many times. Father God, Lord, right now, right here, we ask for a second chance. In fact, we ask for many chances, Lord. But right now, we just ask for the blood of the Lord Jesus to cover our sins. Whatever that sin is, come on, confess that sin right now before God. Just tell God, whatever that sin is, just tell God right now. Oh, Father God, Lord, liberate your people, free them, remove the chains, the shackles, Lord, from the sin of pornography, the sin of lying, the sin of laziness. Lord, forgive us, Lord, of our complacency. Forgive us, Lord, of our compromises. Oh, God, cleanse our temple right now. Just cleanse, Lord, our hands, cleanse our eyes, cleanse our minds, and cleanse our hearts. And Lord, we want to be clean before you right now. Thank you. Because of the blood of Christ, we are covered and we are cleansed. 
Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Brother, sister, you have been released. You've been forgiven. You have been cleansed. Live a life that is pleasing to God now. Now, I want you to go back to your chairs, but those who have physical illness and you want to be prayed for right now, just remain here in front. But you can go back to your seats, those who have been prayed for already with regards to our sins. Let me ask the other leaders, Nelfa, Cynthia, come on, let's just pray for these people who are sick. Let's claim the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and claim the power of Christ. And let's pray for them. Let's pray for them right now.
Let's sing it and thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the dark. To glorious light. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for cleansing us, oh Jesus. Oh, there is power in the blood of Jesus. The blood it never loses its power. Thank you, Lord. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Dear to my heart. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. As we close Praise God. with a benediction, just raise your hands to the heavens and receive this blessing from the Lord. And now, may God Himself, our Father, bless you and keep you and make His face to shine upon you. The Lord will give you strength to face all the challenges this week, the wisdom to accomplish the task beforehand, and His abiding presence will give you joy and peace. The Lord, the God of Israel, will not sleep nor slumber, but will be your constant guide. He shall preserve you from all evil. He will help you win every battle, overcome whatever obstacle, and destroy every stronghold that hinders the advance of the work of God through you, in you, and for you. You are blessed coming in today, and you are blessed going out tonight. Brothers and sisters, go now in the strength of God, with the love of the Lord Jesus and the anointing power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God.